I'm going to begin uh, talking about the life of Joseph. I anticipate four uh, Sunday nights, although we'll have Mother's Day off and we'll have the kids singing. Uh, so we'll have a kind of an intermission, if you will. But, uh, but I figure four nights looking at the life of Joseph. So the, the title tonight uh, is part number one, it's sold. As we're going to see tonight, Joseph sold into slavery. Probably a story, or if you want to, I don't like saying story, but an event, a real life event uh, that we're probably most of us familiar with. In fact, I imagine most of the things we're going to look at in the remainder of the book of Genesis are probably things, if you spent much time in church, especially children's church, uh, you're probably familiar with. But, uh, but we're going to look at his life. He's one of the heroes of the faith. Joseph did some incredible things, and we're going to see throughout this over the next couple of weeks uh, some things that I think we can learn from his life, even if we're already very familiar with Joseph. Before we begin... Uh, just to tell you a little bit about him, it's, it's things that we've seen over the last few weeks. If you've been coming on Sunday night, uh, we've talked about his father, Jacob. We've talked about the very unusual family dynamic that Joseph was born into. Not just the fact that he had 10 older brothers and at least one older sister and a, and a younger brother and several sisters somewhere in there because it says daughters is plural. So we don't know how many other girls were in the home. So right away, just having so many siblings would be strange, but he's unique in that he had four mothers living in his house. You know, we talked about the sisters Rachel and Leah, and we talked about the maids that they brought into the relationship. So Joseph was born into a very unique family. We've already seen him prior to chapter 37, just as scripture mentioned his birth, but where we're going to pick up tonight, he's 17 years old. So we might call him a kid, but in that culture, he was a man. He was uh, considered a man from 13 in that culture, so at 17, he would be a full-grown man. Normally, for a 17-year-old in that culture, he would have a lot of responsibility. He would be, especially being a young man, he would be working out in the field. He would be tending to the flock. And we see that he does have some chores to do, some responsibility, but not nearly as much as what was put on his 10 older brothers. But yet he did have more than what was put on his baby brother, Benjamin. That's one of the many reasons that Joseph's brothers didn't think too highly of him. They worked a lot harder than he did. They had a lot more expected of them than Joseph did. I don't know if you have older siblings. I have a brother who's 11 months older than me. Uh, do you ever get picked on by an older sibling when you were a kid? <laughs> you did. Maybe, maybe you were the one doing the picking. I'm not, is that you, anybody? Y'all picked on your younger siblings? I don't know. It doesn't just have to be older siblings, you know. Maybe, maybe your younger sibling picked on you. I don't know. But, but you know, my brother and I, we were competitive. And, and maybe that's more because we were boys. Maybe it's because we're less than a year apart. Or maybe uh, it's just, you know, because of who we were. I don't know. Uh, but even though we were competitive, even though we would argue at times, even though we would get in physical fights at times, we loved each other. We never once told each other we hated each other, never once said, I don't like you, or he never looked at me and said, I wish you were never born, or anything like that. Uh, brothers fight, siblings fight, you compete, you argue, even grown-up siblings. You know, we, we may have a disagreement, and we might not agree on everything, but we still love each other at the end of the day. And, and I hope you can say that about your own family, but Joseph was not able to say that. Joseph's brothers, they picked on him, they were cruel to him, they were horrible to him, and they didn't do it in love. At the end of the day, they didn't all sit around and say, oh, but Joseph, you know we love you. It wasn't like that at all. In fact, if you take notes, only two points tonight. Number one, Joseph was hated by his brothers. They did not like him at all. In fact, Scripture uses that word hatred several times in chapter 37. If you're there in Genesis 37, look at verse 4. It says, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him, and they could not speak peaceably unto him. They hated Joseph. And that word hate pops up several more times. But they, they couldn't even speak peaceably. They couldn't get along with him at all. They, they couldn't even tolerate his presence. They hated him. And that's a very strong word, but why did they find themselves in this position? Why did they hate Joseph so much? What did he ever do to them? Well, they hated him, first of all, they hated him for his dreams. Joseph was a dreamer, and he didn't keep his dreams to himself. Look at these two dreams that he felt like he should share with his brothers, beginning in verse 5. It says this. It says, Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him yet the more. 
He said unto them, Here, I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and bowed themselves down to mine. And his brethren said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or will you indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him even more for his dream and for his words. That's just the first dream. He dreamed yet another dream in verse 9, and he told his brothers, and he said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream again. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. Eleven stars. I wonder who they could be. He has ten older brothers and one younger brother. And the sun and the moon, his father understood. Look at verse 10. He told it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him, and he said, What is this dream? That you have dreamed. Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come and bow down ourselves to you? And his brothers envied him, but his father observed this saying. He feels the need to share these dreams. There's nothing wrong with having the dreams. In fact, I believe God gave him these dreams. But you know, some things, just because they're true, some things are better left unsaid. Some things are better written down in a diary or a journal and tucked away somewhere and not necessarily shared with everybody. Now, I don't know that there's necessarily anything wrong with him sharing these dreams. I, you know, I'm, tr I'm trying to be fair, because the Bible doesn't really say. But it says that his father rebuked him for it. Not that his dad was the model father anyway, so I guess we can't take much stock in that. But he shares this with his brother. Hey, guys, guess what? I had this dream last night, and all of you were bowing down to me. And we can't help but wonder if maybe this 17-year-old, even though he's speaking the truth, maybe he has just a touch of mockery taunting in his voice, the way he's telling his brothers. And, and then the second dream, oh, by the way, Dad, you're going to love this one. This time you and Mom are in it, and you guys are also bowing down to me. Even, even little Benjamin, he's bowing down to me. You know, just because something's true doesn't mean we have to say it. And I think that's a good lesson for the church to learn, especially with, as it involves social media and things like that. We feel like we have to say everything that pops into our mind sometimes. Or even if we're saying something, maybe we should Think about the way it comes across. Joseph is speaking truth, possibly a picture that God was giving him, because his dreams will come to pass later on in life. So I believe God gave him these dreams, but I also think he's kind of rubbing it in with his brothers a little bit. And maybe he felt like he had to. Maybe they were always on his back. Maybe this was like the one thing he could say to his brothers about this dream that he had. Yeah, well, one day you guys are all going to regret it. One day you're going to be bowing down to me. One day you're going to come crawling to me when you want something. And, and so he shares this dream with his father, but it says that Jacob, he rebuked him. But then kind of like when it died down, it says, but Jacob, his father, says he kept this dream. He continued to think about it. And that reminds me of what Luke 2 says about him. After the birth of Jesus and the whole narrative, it says that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. It's like I can just imagine sometimes Mary sitting there just still trying to take it all in. And I get that same idea here with Jacob. It's like, Joseph, Joseph, you shouldn't do that. Me and your mom, your brothers, we're not going to bow down to you. And then he's kind of in by himself and he's like, maybe he did. You know, well, why else would he have this dream? Why is he sharing that? Jacob, after all, had received a pretty impressive dream from God, too. Remember Jacob's ladder? And so now he's probably thinking, well, God spoke clearly to me. And he had to understand the covenant and how important his children were in the role of this covenant. And he's looking at his oldest, Reuben. He's no good. And Simeon and Levi, they're no good. We saw Judah last week. He's no good. Maybe Jacob's starting to think, maybe Joseph's on to something. And so Joseph is speaking the truth. These dreams are real, but possibly the way he shared them wasn't right. But his brothers hated him. They already hated him. Then they hated him even more after the dream. So they hated him for his dreams, but next they hated him for his dad. We read the verse, verse 4, that says Jacob loved Joseph more than the rest of his sons. Verse 3 says that. It says Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made for him a coat of many colors. Why was Joseph the favorite? Why did he love him more than anyone else? It says he was the son of his old age. You know, we, we spent one Sunday night talking about all these children and, and when they were coming and which of his four wives were producing these children. But it was that wife 
Rachel, the one that he loved from the start, that he didn't get to marry. He was tricked into marrying Leah, and then ultimately he got to marry Rachel. But Leah's having all these children, and so Rachel says, here, this is the culture, this is the custom here, take my maid, have children with her. She was, well, then Rachel, uh, Leah stopped having children, so she brought in her maid. So now three different women are having children. Then Leah starts having children again, and all this time Rachel is barren. But finally, after years and years of anguish and praying, the Lord gave her this child. And so jo- Jacob no doubt looked at Joseph as the baby boy of his favorite wife, the only one he ever intended to marry. If he had done it his way and not been deceived by his father-in-law, it would only be Jacob and Rachel. And Joseph was supposed to be his firstborn, that covenant child, the firstborn son, but it didn't work out that way. And now here he is, this older man, probably thinking, when Joseph's born, I'm probably not having any more children here, and it was only Benjamin he had years later. I'm sure he babied Joseph a little bit. I'm sure he wanted to protect Joseph a little bit. He probably said, Joseph's not like those other guys. He's not like Simeon. He's not like Levi. He's not like Judah. He's he's different. He's special. This is my baby boy. And, you know, we see that a lot of times with the baby. My wife has to pee on the bed. And, and you know, it's kind of like when you know, you know it. It's kind of like when, you know, when you're, when you're done having children, you go, this is my last one. This, this is the last one who I'm going to teach him to tie his shoes. This is the last one that I'm going to dress and change and baby. You, you, you hold on to it a little bit longer. And it says that Joseph was the child of his old age. Like he's saying, Joseph's it. He's the last one I've got. And he wanted to make him his baby long as he could, and, and certainly Benjamin came along later, but, but he loved Joseph because of that. Is it right that he loved him more than his other children? No, not, not going to condone that at all. But how was Jacob raised? He was raised by a mother that loved him more than Esau did, and he had a father that loved Esau more than him. And so even though his parents were together, it's kind of like he had a broken home and a, and a bad home life, and so we can almost sympathize with not letting them off the hook it's wrong and parents obviously should never play favorites love one more than the other or show favoritism but what did he do he made joseph this special coat this coat of many colors a coat of any color was special in that culture because putting any kind of color into fabric is a very expensive and hard process so most clothing started off white and then became kind of pale and dusty and but to have any color at all was rare. If Joseph's gone, if, if what that says of many colors, if that's what that means, it's a very a lot of debate on the Hebrew word. But if what that means is many colors, this was an incredibly special, expensive gift. And every time he put that coat on, it's like saying, I'm somebody important. Because if anybody had color, that was a way of showing off money. They didn't have to have any color. That was a luxury purchase. And if you wore any kind of color at all, it's like saying, I'm somebody special. So if Joseph is putting on this colorful coat saying, look at all the money that went into this one coat I'm wearing. And it was a way of him to kind of show off who he was or for his father to show off his love for Joseph. There's debate on that word. Most people have always said many colors. But some newer translations now are calling it a coat of long sleeves. It's, it's, a, it's not used in any other ancient Hebrew literature, so it's, taught, it's, it's debated what it means. But if it's not a coat of many colors, but instead a coat of long sleeves, think about that. Think about that as it relates to a worker out in the field. They didn't wear long sleeves. The customary garment for someone who worked, especially shepherds, was to wear something where the sleeves were cut off at the shoulder. That gives you free range of motion with your arm. Maybe you do that when you work outside. Maybe you like to roll your sleeves up or wear something with no sleeves. It turns out young guys you like to show off. I know some of y'all are like that. You like, you, you know, but you like to show off your biceps a little bit or work on your tan. But really, what that's about is just not being restricted when you work. When I used to work for FedEx, the first thing I would do was cut the sleeves off of all my shirts because you get in there, you start moving around, and my my sleeves would start getting wrapped around and tighter. Not because my upper body is so large, but just from the nature of moving my arms around so often. And when I'd cut my sleeves off, I could work. Now, maybe you work in a place like that, or maybe you've been in a factory or a plant or something where you're doing the hard job, you're sweating, you're getting dirty, and then somebody comes in wearing a white collar, long sleeves, maybe a jacket, tie, and you think, that person's probably not doing the same type of job I'm doing. Now, you don't resent them. Maybe they used to do what you did, and and maybe they have been promoted or something. But 
if somebody comes walking in, like when I was in those FedEx trailers and somebody would walk in with a white shirt and tie, I'd think, this guy's not here to load a trailer. I can just guess that. But it's kind of the same way with Joseph. His brothers are wearing sleeveless coats out in the field as they're tending to the sheep. And then here comes Joseph with his coat. Maybe it's not many colors. Maybe it's a coat of long sleeves. It says, I'm not a field worker like the rest of you guys. I'm a little more important than that. I don't have to do the grunt work that you're doing. Y'all are blue collar. I'm white collar. And so his 10 older brothers would be out in the field sweating and working hard and slaving in the sun. And then here comes their little brother with his long sleeve coat on. It would be like him showing up with a suit and tie while they're out there doing the hard work saying, I don't have to do what you guys do because daddy likes me best. See the special coat he's given me? This says I don't have to work like the rest of you. Whether it was many colors that said he was wealthy or special, or whether it was long sleeves that said he did not have to work like his day laborers, either way, his brothers hated him. And we know the motivation behind it. It says because, simply because he was Jacob's favorite. He loved him more than any other child, and he gave him a special coat. His brothers hated him because of his dreams. They hated him because of his dad, and just for good measure, they hated him because he was a cattle man. Look how this chapter opens in verse 1 and 2. It says, Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. It says, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. It says, the lad, which means the young man, was with the sons of Bilhah, and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father an evil report. What that means is while four of his brothers, not Leah's or Rachel's, but the, the handmaids, while Joseph is out following around his four older brothers, he's coming back and telling dad what they're doing, bringing them an evil report. Basically, he's a tattletale. Now, maybe they were doing something bad and he's right for telling his father, but I'll tell you who probably didn't like it was his older brother. You know, when Jacob comes and gets on to him, like, there's only one way dad could have known what we were doing. And then they turn and they look at Joseph. It had to be Joseph that told on us today. And so they already hate him. He already thinks he's better than them. He's telling them about his dreams. Their father shows his love for them. And now, on top of all of that, he's a tattletale. It's like, well, no wonder dad likes you the most. You're running back then telling him everything that we do wrong. And you know the old expression, snitches get stitches. That's what's about to happen to my uncle next. Would you mind me? You uh, you see what's going to happen to Joseph next. Number one, he's hated by his brothers, but number two, he's hurt by his brothers. Eventually, they have enough. They're tired of daddy's favor. They're tired of the tattletale. They're tired of this dreamer with the special coat, and they finally have a plan one day to take care of him. In verse 12, it tells us, that his brothers, these ten older brothers, they went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Now, we can stop right there and ask, why in the world would they go to Shechem? Remember Shechem? That was the place where their sister was raised. That was the place where two of them got every man in the city incapacitated and murdered every man in the entire city. That was the place where they took all the women and children as their slaves. Why in the world would they go on a three days journey to Shechem? We can only imagine that whatever they were up to was no good. They were probably doing something where they were getting away from Joseph the tattletale and Jacob the father. We're going to get over here where we can do whatever we want and nobody's going to know what we're up to. And so in the next verse, Joseph or Jacob says to Joseph, hey, why don't you go check on your brothers? I know you're so good at bringing back a report to me on what they're up to, so why don't you ride down to Shechem and see what they're doing down in Shechem? So Joseph goes down there, can't find them. Turns out they've moved on to Dothan, which is another day's journey away. So Joseph finally finds his brothers. But they see him coming, probably because of that special coat. Look at verse 18. It says, When they saw him afar off, even before he came near to them, which might indicate it was colorful, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer is coming. Now let us... Uh, come together and slay him and cast him into a pit, and we will say that some beast has devoured him, and then we will see what becomes of his dreams. It shows us just how much those dreams got under their skin. They call him a dreamer. It really means dream expert. 
They're saying, oh, look, the dream expert is coming, which oddly enough, Joseph would become a dream expert. One day he's going to be in prison and people are going to begin telling him their dreams and the Lord's going to give him an interpretation. He really would become a dream expert. But they say, oh, look, here comes Mr. Dreamer. Here comes the guy that knows what all these dreams mean. Hey, let's, let's kill him. We'll make up a plan. We'll say he was killed by wild animals. It was an accident. We just stumbled upon him. And then we'll see what becomes of all those dreams. He thinks we're going to bow down to him when he's dead. There's no way we'll ever bow down to him. And so they begin to hatch this plan. He's hurt by his brothers, first of all, because of the pit. In verse 24, it says this, They took him and they cast him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Dothan, the place where they were, in Hebrew means two wells, which assumed then that one well had dried up and a new well was dig. And they thought, hey, with this empty well here, we can throw Joseph in there and nobody will ever find him. This deep pit he can never climb out of, we can toss him down there. And hey, we didn't kill him. I mean, he, he might starve to death or die of thirst, but it's not like we did it. You know, hey, we'll let that settle itself. We'll just toss him in the pit. Our hands will be clean from it. And that's what they decide to do. The only bright spot in all of this is that the firstborn son, Reuben, says, hey, guys, let's, let's not kill him. It's actually his idea to throw him in the pit. Let's not kill Joseph. Why don't we just toss him down there? So how's that a bright spot? The Bible tells us his plan was to come back later and rescue Joseph. And he's the firstborn son. He should have the absolute authority among his nine younger brothers to call the shots. The firstborn son got to decide what to do in family matters like this if the father wasn't around. It should be whatever Reuben says goes. However, Reuben had forfeited his right to the firstborn status when he had slept with Bilhah, his father, one of his father's wives. When he did that, he was no longer able to be credible among his brothers. So he could not say, guys, let's not kill him. He had to come up with a plan. Hey, let's throw him in the pit. But the Bible says he's going to go back later and rescue Joseph from the pit. But because of the mistake he had made, because of the sin that he had committed, he was not in a position to save his brother's life. The best he could do was say, well, let's not murder him outright. Let's toss him in the pit. And they agree to that. And so they throw him in the pit. They sit down. They begin to heap money. You're pretty depraved if your brother can be in a pit screaming for his life and you're having a sandwich at the base of the well. But it says they sit down to eat lunch and they're trying to think, all right, well, what do we do next? And he's sitting in the pit, no doubt scared to death, he had to be yelling, help, help, at the top of his lungs, and they sit down to lunch. And while they do, we see the people that come in verse 25, the caravan comes in. It says, as they sat down to eat bread, they lifted up their eyes and they looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices and balms and myrrh, and they were going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill him and conceal his blood? Come. And let us sell him, and our hands will not be upon him. For he's our brother and our own flesh. Well, that's very nice of him. So his brothers were content. So they sell their brother for 20 pieces of silver. Ten brothers, 20 pieces of silver. What's his life worth to them? Two pieces of silver. That's ultimately what they each get out of the deal, so divide it equally. We'll sell our brother for two pieces of silver each. And whatever they want to do with him is fine with us. So they sell him. Whose idea is it? Judah. Last week, we were ahead in chapter 38. We saw how Judah just abruptly left the family and went down to Canaan. We saw the, the, the tragedy with him and Tamar and the death of his sons. Why did he abruptly leave and go to Canaan? I wonder if it's the guilt and the remorse he felt because of what he decided to do here. Hey, let's sell him into slavery. And that's what they do. Reuben returns in verse 29, and you almost feel sorry for him. It says Reuben returned to the pit. He must have been off tending the sheep or doing something and was not there when they sold Joseph. It says he returns to the pit, and behold, Joseph is not in the pit. And he ripped his clothes, and he returned to his brothers, and he said, The child is not, and, and I don't know where he went. He says, Where shall I go? He says, I don't know what to do. He's overwhelmed when he gets to the pit, and he sees that Joseph is not there. The one remotely good person in this whole thing is Reuben. Oh, guys, let's throw him in the pit. And the Bible says his intention is to come back and rescue him later. And then when he does, he comes back and Joseph is gone. And then he finds out that they have sold him into slavery. 
and in one of the, the cruelest things they could do to their father, they took off that special coat, they ripped it up, they dipped it in the blood of one of their own animals, their father's animals, that they were supposed to be taken care of. And they don't even have the guts to face their dad themselves. He's one of their servants. They send him back to Jacob. And here's the message. Not, not Joseph's dead, but look, we found this coat. Can you decide if this belongs to Joseph or not? You, you tell us, is this, of course it's Joseph's coat. There's not a coat like it in all the world. This was custom made for Joseph. And so Jacob takes this bloody, ripped up coat, and he says, surely my son is dead. And he's brokenhearted. He rips his clothes. He covers himself in ashes, which is a symbol of his mourning. And the chapter ends by saying that his sons and his daughters tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. He says, I will go to the grave mourning my son. Could you imagine being one of his ten older brothers? It says they tried to comfort their father. How do you try to comfort the man who's brokenhearted because you lied to him and told him his son's dead? Because you sold his son into slavery for two pieces of silver. How do you try to comfort him? Oh, there, there, Dad. I, I'm sure he went quickly when those wild animals tore him apart. I mean, what can you say to try to comfort this grieving father? I couldn't imagine the guilt. I couldn't imagine what had to be bearing on him. And, and I imagine that's why Judah left. It was his idea to sell him. And his father refuses to get over it. No, 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 I'm going to mourn for Joseph until the day I die. I think Judah couldn't take it. I think that's why he just got out of town and tried to start his own life away from his grieving father, trying to forget what he had done. Is this the end of Joseph, though? He sold into slavery. Verse 36 says, the Midianites, also the Ishmaelites, and this is an interchangeable term, but it says that the Midianites sold Joseph to Egypt and to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and the captain of the guard. That might sound like the end of the story, especially as chapter 38 changes topic. But you know it's not. Joseph is alive and well and not uh, the last that we're going to see Joseph. We're going to end there in Scripture tonight, but I, I want to end by thinking about these brothers. You can't keep your sin hidden forever. I wonder if they ever stopped worrying that one day Joseph would walk through the door. Could you imagine if Joseph just showed up one day? What if, what if he was able to escape? What if he earned his freedom? What if he came home and then he shows up? And, and Joseph, or Jacob sees his son alive again and says, Joseph, I don't understand what happened. Could you imagine being one of those ten brothers? You'd be like your stomach drops, like, oh, now we're in trouble. You know, this guy, we told dad he was dead years ago. I imagine there was never a day for the rest of their lives where they didn't, in the back of their mind, wonder, what if Joseph comes home? What if dad finds out? What if he finds out we lied to him? What if he finds out what we did to his little boy? What if he finds out what we did to him and this lie we've kept up for years? It's no fun to have a dirty little secret. It's no fun to bear the guilt and constantly be worried about being found out. It's no way to live life, but that is the life that these ten boys chose for themselves because of what they did that day to Joseph. When you lie and try to keep your sin covered, you have to lie again and lie again and do everything you can to keep it from being exposed. You can lie about it, you can hide it, you can try to bury that sin, but you can't keep it hidden forever. In the book of Numbers 32, 23, it says, to be sure that your sin will find you out. Three times in Matthew 6, it says, your father which sees in secret will reward you openly. We might think we got everybody fooled. We might think that they bought the lie and I've got away with it. But that's no way to live life. Now, I'm not telling you how something might get found out. I'm not telling you how some sin might be exposed. I'm not saying that there's going to be this very public finding out of it. It does happen with Joseph later on. But what I do know is that our Heavenly Father sees in secret. If you find yourself always having to look over your shoulder to make sure no one's watching, you're probably not living the right kind of life. And what you might think is being done in secret, your Father knows all too well about. Every detail that we think that we have to hide and lie about and bury, God sees it all. What we do in the darkness, he sees in the light. What we try to hide, he brings out in the open. It's no way to live trying to keep a secret exposed. For these ten brothers, at any point, they could have gone to Jacob and said, Dad, listen, we've got to come clean about this. We've got to tell you something. You're, you're going to hate us, 
It might even kill one of us, but we've got to tell you the truth. Their father was incredibly wealthy. He was known almost around the world. And there's, there's a lot that Jacob could have done to track down Joseph, even in Egypt, if he knew that his baby boy was alive. But year after year after year, they kept this lie concealed. But they could have come clean at any time. We can come clean at any time. Look, if there's something in your life that you know shouldn't be there, don't keep trying to hide it. Don't keep trying to bury it. Because the more lies we tell to keep it exposed, it only makes it worse when we do get found out. Come clean today. Confess it to the God who already knows about it. Maybe confess it to the person that you're trying to keep it from. It's no way to live keeping our sin exposed, uh, keeping our sin hidden. Because it will be exposed. And we were not meant to bear that guilty conscience. If we live our lives putting our energy into trying to keep sin under wraps, then we're probably not carrying out the great commission. We're probably not seeing the lost one. We're probably not discipling the saved because we're putting our effort into keeping our sin covered up. Therefore, we're rendered useless for the cause of Christ. It's exactly what Satan wants, but not at all what God wants. So if that's you today, you've got something you're trying to keep covered up, confess it to me. Repent of it. Turn from it. Bring it out to the light. Confess it to God and remove it give you a fresh start. It'll make you useful for him again. But in the meantime, you're not doing the Lord any good. So let's make sure this doesn't apply to us. If you need to confess something, let's do it tonight. Please stand where you are with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And maybe tonight you've been convicted of something. Maybe tonight God has 